Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here over at Synopsys with Rebecca LePon, who's going to talk about one of the big problems that's coming out in design these days, which is all the unknowns. So as complexity increases, so do the number of unknowns, and what do you do about them? Rebecca, when you look at design these days, there's all sorts of unknowns that are creeping into it. How do we deal with it? What do we have to do? Is it all about raising the abstraction level? I think raising the abstraction level is one of the first ways we try and address any level of complexity, right? Trying to catch every scenario in traditional design modes works to a point, and then we get to an exponential increase in those scenarios, and we have to look for alternate methods. So the same sort of thing happened with timing analysis, where we used to do it in gate level simulation, but now we really do most of it in static tools. So it's the same desire to take a problem, unknowns, in your standard simulation model that are occurring more because of the number of low power designs we're dealing with and the number of power domains we have, and trying to eliminate that by moving it into a different abstraction level or a different way of attacking the problem. So this is a bit of a mess here, but trying to show kind of a typical scenario where I've got a power domain and I've got a bit of logic that's dependent on one another. And basically, in, in the proper design of this circuit, when I would have an assignment to A, I would be dependent on a signal B, so here I've got a flop B, and because it's in a power domain, I would have qualified that signal B with a power on reset. So as long as the power on, the power's on, I will reset this flop and have proper initialization of a real value coming in to my end and then get the proper intended value of one out. I'm not gonna walk through all the code, but this is the, the proper beautiful way. I've got my power domain coming in, I've initialized my flop in perfectly, and I've got the right value coming out. The problem is, let's say our designer wrote this code, or even we leveraged a piece of legacy code that didn't realize it was in a power domain. And so I forgot my power on reset. I just had a standard reset, and unfortunately what happened was the synthesis tool, knowing that the power wasn't on, would prune that qualifying signal. So suddenly, my flop is uninitialized. I will then drive an X on this input, and then I will get the wrong value out of this logical circuit. And this is the kind of X we deal with all the time. So the reason why this is a problem in simulation semantics is that X being driven on this input means that it's not A, right? So I'm, if A will evaluate to oh, I'm not A, so I'll take the else branch, and I'll take the else branch and drive the value of zero, 01. But that's actually not really what I wanted to do. I wanted this to be A, it should have been qualified, it should have been driven correctly with a value of one, and we should have taken the A branch. So it would have been legitimate, it would have been good code if I had just really initialized this flop correctly. So this is an ephemeral simulation issue that's occurred, it's a false X that's being driven on the output because of a, an issue with the logic. And I wouldn't have found this until I ran gate level simulation, had the synthesis tool prune this, and finally saw the X show up. So in regular simulation, it would have given me the same output regardless of what the actual implementation would be. So this is the kind of problem that we're trying to deal with. This is X optimism in simulation. Where do you see designers really running into problems? What are they doing wrong? It seems like the number one reason why we're seeing these kinds of problems is power. They existed before. I mean, this is something that is part of the simulation model, but because 60% of de designs that are being simulated have low power circuitry, the number of cases of unknowns that can be driven into the simulator, and so therefore the amount that designers are having to kind of wade through to find the answer is really it's become an exponential number. So it's, it's an inflection point in that sense. It's coming in because of low power, it's coming in because of legacy code that is in new power configurations, and so these are many more modes that your design can get into than what you originally were thinking of when you designed it. When you're talking lots of these X's, how many are we talking? Are we talking hundreds, are we talking thousands, are we talking millions, where are we num where's the number? We dearly hope that in terms of the false X's, these are not a huge number. Um, what we've seen working with customers is that there will be three to five 
bugs, true bugs. Now there's, there'll be semantic issues that are caught earlier in the design by using this kind of semantic tool, but really the ones that would have led to major design killing bugs, we're looking at one, three, five small numbers, but they're the kinds of numbers that would have been entire respins because this design wouldn't have gotten out of power, for example. We wouldn't have actually gotten out of reset and driven the correct values. So it would have been garbage in, garbage out in a design. So not, not the kind of bugs we want to see. Does it vary depending upon process nodes? So are, are we seeing more bugs and, and problems in the FinFET world than we were at 28 nanometers, for example? It's an interesting point. I think what we're seeing is that when people go to FinFET, they're trying to reduce power. So we're seeing a lot of those 14 nanometer process nodes occurring with a lot of low power circuitry. So it's more correlation than causation. And also when you're talking about power, sometimes we're talking about things like uh, dynamic v uh, frequency voltage scaling. We're talking about uh, potentially near threshold computing. So we're not dealing with very specific numbers anymore. What happens there? So what happens there is sort of an interesting combination, I would say, of dynamic approaches as well as static approaches. So there are going to be scenarios that have to be caught dynamically. Frequency is a scenario where we absolutely are going to have to look at this because without modeling the full scope of what's happening functionally, we won't catch it. Um, and some can be handled in a static world, looking at, at particular problems, squashing particular problems. For X's specifically, we see an interesting thing happening in the industry where we sort of have some formal techniques that are really trying to focus on X squashing because there's X optimism, which is this kind of scenario, and then there's X pessimism. And X pessimism can be just as painful in some sense. I mean, a lot of X's are showing up in your gate level sims that actually aren't real. There are reconvergent paths or some other scenarios occurring. So we need to look at that in other modes and again, this will help solve some problems, and we're gonna have to look at other methodologies like formal for, for other problems. And in dynamic problems, where we're dealing with uh, DBFS, for example, we're, we're starting to deal with X's over time, right? It's not just a static X where it's just in one place. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think there, we have to start looking at using assertions. We have to start looking at using different design modes are being ins inserted as well. So it's a combination of different techniques, some which will be solved by better design processes and the implementation angle, some of which, you know, just the synthesis tools being smarter, and some of which will be, a, have to be handled through functional modeling of the behavior. Also, one of the things that, that's happening now is we're dropping the voltage down below what it was before. How does that affect what you're doing here with all the X's? So, doing, dropping the voltage I mean, from a, a simulation perspective, a one is a one, right? So whether the one is a 0.3 volt one or a 1.2 volt one, it's a one the way we model it. So the complexity from a simulation perspective is trying to capture using some sort of a power intent file what one means in each of these domains and then working with the tools to make sure they've inserted the right isolation cells, the right retention cells, the right startup power sequence to make sure it's correct. So from an insertion perspective, that's where static tools come in. From the sequencing perspective, that's where you need to do dynamic analysis with a simulator. So when we look at that, you know, it's, it's sort of specifically when it comes to the power and these low power you know, modeling scenarios functionally, it's really making sure we map the intent file correctly, we run the right tests, we cover the right scenarios, and we move forward they are related because more X's come up and this will help you find some of those, but they are sort of independent from, from the perspective of the way the simulator looks at it. One of the other pieces that's entered into the design cycle here is all the IP, and particularly third-party IP that's come, come out. So now we have what we assume are ones, but they may not be exactly what we thought they were, right? Exactly. Or they may be ones, except in your specific implementation of them, they're not ones. So that's exactly actually why it's important to address this problem in the simulator because most IP that's being shipped is encrypted or protected in some fashion. It's very hard to go in. The way you can handle this 
another way you could handle this would be better coding semantics, right? You could code triple equals and you know looking for x and z's, so modeling for state and checking all for state instead of what we normally do, which is modeling in two state. So by doing that, you could use a, some sort of a you know insertion tool or parser, pre-parser to check all of your code if all of your code is your own. But as more and more of our designs are coming from third-party vendors and we're having more and more encrypted code, you can't go in and change that code. So with those pieces, particularly, making sure the simulator is doing the full analysis for you on places where there could be issues is going to be a much better way of solving your problem in this kind of design environment. So one of the things that we're having to deal with now that we didn't have to deal with in the past is physical effects used to be something that the functional guys never had to think about, right? <laughs> so how do, how do you work with that now? What, what happens on all the unknowns that come in from the physical side? So I think there's an interesting, we're at an interesting intersection point where it seems like the industry has gotten to the place where we're focusing on using a power intent file. More and more IP vendors are shipping with a power intent file to try and encapsulate how their IP is configured. Not just, this is the femtoseconds that we're going to be counted in and this is how we work functionally, but also this is how we need to be implemented for proper power behavior. So that appears to be the first layer that we're working through. And then we, as simulation vendors, are trying to make sure we are capturing that, modeling it correctly, handling the static checks correctly, inserting the right kind of assertions and working closely with strong vendors to build out good assertions for that behavior so that we model the physical effects as effectively as possible. Um, and then the, the final stage of that is, you know, redoing that analysis, redoing that equivalency through static tools as the tool, as the RTL becomes your net list. Rebecca Lapon, thank you very much for a great explanation. My pleasure.